Good morning, Chapel. Y'all look good today. Y'all look around you. Everybody's coming home from vacation. Oh my gosh, I'm glad that school's back in session. Not out for summer. Good to see you all. You look so good today. Um, I feel a little bit like Pastor did last week, just super pumped to share um, week two with you. I just want to echo the words that he, sh- that he said as far as this, this chapel family. And um, your, your day in and day out, your weekly service of excellence and love. There is so much excellence and love that is put into not only this campus right here, but then in our community. And so thank you for serving with excellence and love. If you missed yesterday uh, prayer service, you missed it. Uh, it has been a dream of Pastor and I that we would see the students really involved and engaged in the local church. And last year, as we began to just pray about um, the new horizons, the new things that God had for chapel, um, one of our passions was that we would see the students connecting in their local church, that it wouldn't be mom and dad's church or grandma and grandpa's church, but that it would be their church. And they wouldn't just come here and then leave here, and then when they go to college, disconnect with that. They would be so connected. And we're seeing the fruit of all of that, just with our musicians up here, media. But then yesterday at the prayer service, our devotion was given to us by Antonio. And it, it was phenomenal. Antonio, I took notes on you yesterday, and I believe you were talking about Zachariah. And, and you said zeal got him to the right, pe- right place. Patience got him to the right time. And he talked about the importance of zeal and patience. And so I just encourage you, show up, invest one hour a month into a prayer service right here at chapel. It's phenomenal and phenomenal to see what God is doing in and through our our, our students. Last week, Pastor launched our basics series with week one, and he talked about faith. And if you weren't here, you can go online to chapelnorth.com. You can grab that message there. But he talked about faith, and he talked about how faith is the prerequisite for hope and love. Number one, faith requires action, because every one of us is given a measure of faith, but you must exercise your faith. Everyone in the building, when you were created, God gave you a measure of faith, but it's up to you to exercise that faith. And you can exercise that faith in one of two ways. You can exercise your faith in a positive way, or you can exercise your faith in a negative way, but either way, you're exercising faith. You're either believing in the negative, speaking to the negative, or you're believing for the positive and speaking into the positive, but either way, you're exercising your faith. And you say, well, how do I exercise my faith in the right way? You exercise your faith in the right way by going right back to the basics, y'all, and that is the word, that is prayer, that is fasting, that is the Holy Spirit, and in a society that has all these new fandangled technologies, you can't go in there and fast forward into your faith, into your next you got to live through it. We're going to talk about that today as we launch into hope. And then number two, as you exercise your faith, you reap a harvest. So if you're exercising your faith positively, you're going to reap a good harvest. If you're exercising your faith negative, you're going to reap a bad harvest, but you're going to reap a harvest for how you're investing your faith. Today, I'm going to continue with week two, and we're going to talk about hope. Faith and hope. And I've been raised, I've been raised around the church. My father was a minister. And I've always heard faith and hope used so interchangeably. And so here is faith and hope. And I'm digging in myself over the last few weeks as I'm preparing because there are two words, there are two things that are seemingly so interchangeable, but yet they're distinct, but yet they're related. That there is a difference between faith and hope is evident in the scripture that is the basis for this current sermon series, and that's found in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 13. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. Two of the three greatest gifts are faith and hope. And here in the scripture you see that they're listed separately. The faith and hope are related concepts, and it's seen in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, that pastor spoke from last week. It is now faith, is confidence in what we hope for. It is assurance about what we do not see. So I like words. I go and I look up the definition of hope. Hope, by definition, is a feeling of expectation. 
a desire for a certain thing to happen. Hope is a feeling of trust. And when you look up the definition for faith, faith is complete trust or confidence in someone or something. And so what is the difference between faith and hope? I'm so glad you asked, because we're going to unpack that today. Hebrews teaches us that hope is an anchor. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 13, it says, Now we have this hope as an anchor for our soul, firm and secure. It says that hope is an, is an anchor. Hope is an anchor. An anchor is something that is used to hold a boat in place. The anchor is what keeps the boat from drifting, ending up in places that it doesn't want to be or places that it doesn't need to be. So then once the boat is anchored, it may shift a little with the waves and the wind, but the captain never has to worry because he knows that his anchor is set. The scripture here teaches us that hope is the anchor of our soul. It is hope that goes below the surface. Hope that goes down. Hope that digs deep. If you know anything about an anchor, when they throw that anchor out, they will give it some resistance to lock it in. It is hope that goes down where you don't see it, where maybe it's dark down there, but it says that you have this hope that is an anchor for your soul. It digs deep. It is grounding. It is like a quiet, strong confidence. Hebrews chapter 6 says that it is firm and secure. Hope is an attitude. Hope is a focus. Hope is patient. It will wait and wait and wait. Hope. This hope. Hope is what you have when it looks dark. Hope is what you have when it feels cold. Hope is what you have out there, down there. Hope is what you have alone. And Hebrews says that we have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. Romans chapter 8 and verse 24 says, For in this hope we were saved. Listen, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? Verse 25, But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. Faith. Last Sunday, pastor talked about faith. And as I pondered, how do faith and hope work? Faith and hope work together. So what you do is you take your faith... And you tie it to your hope. And your faith and your hope are working together. You tie your faith to you. Because the best way I can teach you is that faith and hope are complementary individual, separate, yet connected, and working together. Remember the definition of faith? Danielle, would you put that definition back up there of faith? It says complete trust or confidence in someone or something. Something is that anchor. Someone is Jesus Christ. And so now we see how faith and hope are working together. Because you may not be able to see it, hope, 
the anchor, but it's there and it's keeping you grounded. It keeps you from straying because faith is out here trusting and believing and looking to next, to what does God have next? And hope is saying, don't go too far. Don't stray from Jesus Christ and his promises. Stay grounded in the word. Stay grounded in prayer. Hope is down there, working below the surface, incognito, if you will, keeping you grounded. Hebrews 6, 19, we have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. Romans 8 says, we have this hope, we were saved. So then what is this hope? Hebrews 6. When you read the verses before and after, and that's just something I love to do. Don't just pick one verse out and read it, but go and read the verse and read it in its context. It's very powerful what happens when you read the scripture in context. Likewise, equally powerful when you take it out of context. The writer is teaching us in Hebrews the certainty of God and his promises. He's teaching us in this passage of scripture, the access, y'all listen, the access that each one of us have to the power of the Holy Spirit. The power of the Holy Spirit through Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and what he did for us. So when I was preparing, I went over to Hebrews 6 and the message translation. Now, I like the message translation sometimes because it just kind of comes right down here to the 21st century. It says, we who have run for our very lives to God have every reason to grab the promised hope with both hands. Sometimes you, you, you can't even trust your faith. Sometimes all you got is hope to grab onto. And I love the writer here, he says, because you grab on to the promised hope with both hands and you never let go. Listen, it's an unbreakable. What is this hope? It's an unbreakable spiritual lifeline reaching past all appearances. What you can't even see. Right to the very presence of God, y'all, where Jesus is running ahead of us, has taken up his permanent post as high priest for us in the order of Melchizedek. Jesus Christ is running ahead for us. And so what is going to keep our soul in the right place? It's anchored to this hope. Because see, here's the thing. We're putting our hope, if we're not careful, we'll put our hope in our job, and that can be gone tomorrow. We're putting our hope in maybe a person, and that person can turn on you tomorrow. We're putting our hope in a government, and God, please help you if that's where you're putting your hope at. We're putting our hope in our bank accounts. God help you. We're putting our hope in stock. We're putting our hope in all these things. But it says, if you'll put your hope into this hope, Jesus Christ, the power of the Holy Spirit. It is an unbreakable spiritual lifeline. It says it reaches past all appearances, everything that you can see right into the presence of God. What's going to help us overcome obstacles? What's going to help us reach our dreams and our goals? It's anchored to this hope. And no matter what you face, no matter how big the difficulty is, no matter how long it seems to be taken, then there's this hope that says God is large and God is in charge and his plans are for my good. And he's running ahead of me so he sees and he knows. Because if God allows it, he's going to use it. We fuss and complain and bellyache about stuff that's happened in our life. If it's in your life, God allowed it. I'm not saying that it's ordained by God, but understand this. God will never allow something in your life that he will not use. So when you're anchored to this hope, number one, nothing moves you. When you're anchored to this kind of hope that I'm talking about, nothing moves you. We have a little amen row here today. (laughs) Carrie Starker, raise your hand. Yeah. So two, three years ago, you got a bad doctor's report. They told you you had cancer. When you're anchored to this hope, nothing moves you. 
when you're anchored to this hope, a bad doctor's report can't move you because now you sit here two to three years later healed, healthy, whole. We don't know the cost of your praise. We don't know the cost of your amen and your hallelujah. And so we have to be real careful sometimes when we come into a corporate worship setting and say, well, they're a little loud today. I'm going to tell you what, if I've been through what Carrie Starker's been through, I may be a little loud too. Because you're anchored to this hope and nothing moves you, no matter what they say, no matter what the report is, no matter what the relationship looks like. I'm anchored to this hope and nothing moves me. A couple of weeks ago, our, our interns gave us some sermonettes. And William, 11 years old, was t- telling us the story of Joseph. Now, it was funny because when he started telling them, I'm like, yeah, dude, you don't have to cut that down. I need you to cut that down a little more. I need you to cut that down a little more. But, I mean, in his defense, how do you cut down a story like that? So I want to talk to us today about hope by using that little story of Joseph. It's in Genesis chapter 37 is where it starts, and he's got 11 brothers, and Joseph is the youngest except one. And he has favor on his life, and, uh, and he shares his dreams with his brothers. But his, but his older brothers weren't real happy with the dream, because in the dream, I'm going to paraphrase, but basically uh, uh, he's telling his brothers, y'all are older than me, a bunch of you, ten of you, uh, but you're going to bow down to me one day. And God love him, he's 17 years old, you know? He's just full of fire and just believes that this dream, everybody's going to be happy for him, right? Because haven't you been there before? I have this dream, y'all, and I just believe in they're like, huh? He has another dream, he didn't learn the first time. He goes back and tells them another dream. And this time, even his dad's a little bit like, oh, we're going to worship you? Like you're telling your pops now? Now he's got his brothers and his daddy up in there. Because he knew... If I'm connected to my hope, they can't see it, right? I got this faith out here that's just believing every word that God said to me. And I just believe nothing is going to move me from the promises of God. Now that's interesting because we're going to follow that type of faith and hope working together. Because the scripture says that faith is the substance of things hoped for. You have to have faith. You cannot have faith without hope. And so when I'm anchored to this hope, number one, nothing moves me. Number two, when you're anchored to this hope, God will make things happen that you could never make happen. God will make things happen. God, not your boss, not your finances, not the government. God will make things happen that no man can make happen. Can I get an amen, Carrie? Can I get an amen, Mildred? Mildred and Sheila Breckenridge are part of this church, and several weeks ago we went to the hospital, and it, looked, it didn't look real promising with Beth. And in, and in fact, maybe even our faith got a little weak because we started a meal train because the doctors came in and said, we've done all that we can do, and we're going to send her to hospice. But I believe it was that night or the next day that things started to turn around. There was like a feeling that I can't explain that goes beneath the surface, and it's a hope that says... I don't care what the doctors have said, I'm going to pray anyways. I don't care what the medical report is saying, I'm going to speak in faith anyways. And Beth is in the rehab and coming out soon, standing up, breathing on her own. It's a miracle. It's an absolute miracle. But listen to me, when faith and hope are working together, that's when you see the miraculous. Go into the life of Joseph. He had plenty of opportunity to pull up his anchor. Just read that story. Plenty of opportunity to pull up his anchor. He was betrayed by his brothers. He was thrown into a pit. He had every right, listen, every right to be negative. He had every right to be angry. That's not right. That's my own family acting a fool. My own family doing this to me, right? He had every right. And if we're not careful in the flesh, we'll say, you ought not talk to them. They're hateful. I wouldn't have nothing to do with them. They betrayed you. That, that's our human flesh. But what did Joseph do? He kept his anchor down. He said, there's something going on beneath the surface. And God will never allow something that he is not going to use. And so that is when his hope reached down. His feelings that said, I cannot lean on my own understanding. But in all of my ways, I've got to acknowledge him. And he's going to direct my path. There's a hope that digs down beneath the surface. They sold him into slavery. 
he found favor there. He was falsely accused, thrown into prison, and guess what? He found favor there. If your faith and your hope are tied to this hope, the right source, it doesn't matter where you are. You may not like the job. You may get a bad boss. You may, but you'll find favor there if you keep your faith and hope linked into the Holy Spirit. We curse these things that God has put us into to bring glory to him. All throughout the life of Joseph, he says, I want the glory for myself. God wants the glory for your story. God wants the glory for whatever you're going through. It was unfair. He had a good reason to be negative, bitter, angry. We wouldn't have faulted him. But through all the trouble, listen, through all of Joseph's trouble, through all the things that did not make sense, through all the things that were unfair, he didn't pull up his anchor. Read the story. He never pulls up his anchor. His attitude was... God has the final say. It's not the people that sold me into slavery. Listen, it's not my brothers. It's not my father. It's not Pharaoh. It's not the pit. God has the final say. His attitude was, people do not determine my destiny. Look at your neighbor and say, people don't determine your destiny. Y'all, y'all, do you hear me? Do you hear yourself? Your boss doesn't determine your destiny. That unhealthy relationship doesn't determine your destiny. That friend that betrayed you doesn't determine your destiny. That coworker that gives you hell doesn't determine your destiny. God determines your destiny. All the forces of darkness cannot stop God's plan for your life. Because remember, God opens doors that no man can open, and God closes doors that no man can close. Put your anchor down. Put your hope in Jesus Christ. God made things happen for Joseph that, he, that no man ever could have. We're looking to dad, our mom, our siblings. We're looking to people to make things happen for us. Let's be honest. We've even said, well, if it wasn't for them, I wouldn't be going through this. If it wasn't for them, that wouldn't have happened. No, 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 no. You're putting your destiny. You're putting your anchor in them. Put your anchor in God and say, God will use... Whatever they've done to you, against you, God will use that for your good. He used slavery. He used the prison. He used it all for his good. Number one, when you're anchored to this hope, nothing moves you. Number two, God will make things happen you could never make happen. And number three, God will restore and reward. Listen. God, God will restore and reward. We're looking to the boss on the job to restore, to reward us with finances, to restore us a position. God, restore and reward. When you look at the story, that we should be overwhelmed. That's an, oh, just, just read that for a minute. That's an overwhelming story. And then, I don't know about you, but the thing that's overwhelming to me is it's like he gets out of one obstacle and into another. He gets out of one obstacle and into another. And I'm just like kind of exhausted by the time I'm reading that. Like, dude, he just, he just like was sold by his brothers. They, they left him like they thought, acted like he was dead. And now he gets out of there and now he's going into prison for something that he didn't even do. She lied on him. We're in a society that you are guilty until proven innocent. People will lie on you in a heartbeat and everybody will believe it. And so Joseph had every right to be discouraged. They looked stronger than him. They were more powerful than him. But just like Joseph, you have to put your hope in the Lord. You have to say, if God be for me, who dare be against me? I dare you to be against me if God is for me. Because we are anchored to this hope. And because he was anchored, because you are anchored, you don't stay disappointed. Listen what happened to Joseph. He was vindicated. He was promoted. Y'all, he was put in charge of the whole nation. You don't want to go through what you're going through? Then just stay where you are. You want to be promoted? Listen to me. For every new level, there's a new devil. 
You want a new promotion on your job? You got some new devils to deal with. You want a new house? You want a better house? You got some devils to deal with in that neighborhood. We're blaming the devil for stuff he ain't even got nothing to do with. Actually, it was our stupidity. It's so random. Last night, yesterday was Andre's birthday. Happy birthday to you. He's just like family to us, and so we were celebrating his birthday last night, and Pastor ran an errand to Home Depot, and uh, Andre and I were just sitting there. I think we were preaching back and forth. I think we were practicing the message, and we were just preaching to each other. And all of a sudden, he just stands up from the table, and he flips the light out, and he goes, do you have a fire extinguisher? Now, y'all, y'all know about a year ago, our chimney caught fire. We have something wrong with us and fires. He just flips the switch down, and I was like, what's... And he, do you have a fire extinguisher? I'm like, uh, n- no, I don't think so. I don't know. And I look out there, and y'all... The charcoal was left there after we grilled chicken, and something, I guess, popped out, and it was catching the bag of charcoal on fire. I can't make this stuff up good enough. I, like, we blaming the devil, and he like, you idiot, why'd you leave the fi- charcoal by the fireplace? So all of a sudden, I mean, like, we have a brain freeze, and we, he just goes, Woo, and grabs a glass a bucket, a glass bowl thing on our shelf there, and we start filling it up with water, and here we are, we have teamwork, making the dream work, and he's filling up one bucket, and I'm, he's dousing it, and I'm filling up the other, and we're just back and forth, never realizing that about 10 feet is a water hose. <laughs> I'm going to tell you, I lost two pounds last night. I know I did. We were, I mean, we were learning a lesson on teamwork. I mean, we were just looking out there. We were dousing that thing, so I said, I mean, after about literally, I don't know how many buckets of water, probably at least... I want to be evangelistic right now. It felt like 200, but it was probably 50 buckets of water. And then I was like, do you think that's enough water? And he touches it. And he goes, no, just do more, more. <laughs> so when finally, we're trying to call Jared. He ain't answering. <clears throat> Said he didn't have no signal. Said he didn't have no signal in Home Depot. But I've always had signal in Home Depot. But I'm literally, I'm hell-bent like, we are not calling 911 again. We've done call 911. The fire trucks are out there on a Sunday morning at 7 o'clock. Like, what's going on in there? We got the fire of the word coming to chapel today. Y'all better get there. <laughs> so we're like hell-bent. We're not going to call the, the 911. So when Jared walks in, finally, after emergency, please call, whatever, he walks in the house, just like calm, cool, and collected. He's like, well, there's the fire extinguisher right there, which we pass every time we go in and out of the garage. <laughs> and he said, uh, buckets, I mean, there's like water all over our kitchen floor. The rug is soaking wet. And he goes, um, there's a hose right there, like 10 feet. <laughs> Y'all, sometimes you have to laugh at yourself. We're going, oh, that's just Satan. He don't want me to preach tomorrow. He wants to burn my house down and take my blessings. No, there's sometimes Jesus is just saying, use some common sense. Just use some common sense. I better get to my notes. Nothing moves you. Nothing moves moves you. Nothing moves you. When you're anchored in hope, and we're talking about basics, right? Basics. Where does our faith come from? Where does our hope come from? It's the Word of God, y'all. I I know we keep saying this. I can't give you a self-help plan that's going to... The Word of God. If you're not into the Word of God, man, this... I'm going to share some scriptures with you in just a minute about the hope that you find in the Word of God. If you are not a person of prayer... Like, man, prayer, it literally is like the rope of faith that just soars. When I'm in prayer, like, oh my gosh, I see this. I believe this can happen. I think the impossible. I, because look at if you are dreaming dreams that you can do, that's no dream at all. I believe that the power that lies in the local church and the power that lies in Christ followers, y'all, we got to be speaking some bold things. We got to be praying some bold prayers. I am praying bold prayers for deliverance. I believe that, I know, I am confident, y'all, that God can set us free from drug addictions, from alcohol addictions, from spiritual. I believe that. But we're so passive, we're so scared about those things. 
We were in a, in a situation uh, about a few weeks ago, and it was just a spiritual situation. It was a very dark spirit. It was a very evil spirit. We had been, been in prayer and fasting. And so be careful when you go into prayer and fasting. Be on the lookout for it. And Bella was hiding behind me, and she was like, Mom, can I go get in the car? And I was like, no! No, watch what Jesus is about to do. When I was growing up, I didn't get to go hide in the car. I was hiding under the pews watching Jesus deliver people. But look, look, we laugh at Bella, but we're just like it. We're, just, we're like, all of a sudden we have an evil coworker, and we're like, ooh, Jesus, mm, messing with that. Can you move my cubicle four rows over? I don't want to be right here. I'm going to go move to a new department. But if we have this faith that Jesus Christ is the deliverer, and we have this hope that through the power of the Holy Spirit, digging beneath the surface that God can and God will, and that God could use you, that God could use you to change the atmosphere in your job, in your business, that God could and wants to use you. People of faith and of the word and of prayer and of fasting, nothing moves you. Number two, God will make things happen that you could never make happen. I'm telling you, leave here today and quit putting your hope, quit putting your faith in some person or something and go from here and say, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest, uh-huh, that, yes, mm-hmm, the holy lean on Jesus' name. Know your words when you pray too. And number three, God will restore and reward. It's not in my notes, but there's a story of the Shunammite woman, and I would encourage you to research it. It's in 2 Kings chapter 4 and 2 Kings chapter 8. It's an amazing uh, story about faith and hope. And so she builds a room on her house. Her husband does, builds a room to put her trouble in. Little did they know when they were building the room that she couldn't have a child. And so the miracle came when she had a child. And then... The, the child was like 10 years old, and the child dies. And so the father, so many messages in this, but the father brings, or sends the child to the mother, and that's when we as women, we get a little ticked off. Like, well, why don't you pray for the kid? You're too busy working. I mean, like, ain't he your son? Pray for him. But he doesn't. He sends him to the mom. The mom's praying, holding him in his arm, holding the boy in her arms, and he dies. She goes and puts him in the room that they built for the prophets. Little did she know, 10 years prior, she was building a room to put her troubles in. She goes to the prophet, and she said, he says, is everything okay? And she said, yeah, it is well. See, we've got to stop saying, if God does that. Sick faith, right? Sick faith. If God does it. What if we started saying, when God gives me that new job? When God does that miracle? When, because my faith... Is so tied to my hope. And guess what? The prophet comes and she says, everything's well, but um, my boy is, is dead at the house, and I know that if you'll come pray for him, like oh, so much in that story, come, boy's healed. A couple years later, when you fast forward in that scripture, you'll find that um, they're going, they're, there's a famine coming to the land, and the prophet comes and he says, hey, you need to um, move. And now we have a problem there too, right? Why can't God just save me in that situation? Why can't he deliver me in that situation? But he makes her move seven years, makes her move away seven years, comes back, timing of God, comes back at the precise moment when the prophet is telling the king her story. Timing's everything. And in about seven seconds, God restores and rewards. The prophet looks at me and says, oh, oh, okay, it's you. He said, hey, take her back to her land. Give her all her land back. Restore and he said, and give her all the produce, all the, the excess, whatever came over the last seven years, give it to her. Y'all, we spend seven years working on our own strength and ability. And if we'll just lean into God, do what God says, go where God tells you to go, be a person of the word, of prayer, of fasting, of the spirit, God will do more in seven minutes what you are working seven years to do. That's why some of us are so exhausted, because our hope is in ourself. Our hope is in our ability. Our hope is in what we can do. But if you'll put your hope in the Word of God, I'm telling you before you ever walk out of the house, say, God, my hope is in you today. I need your, I don't feel like doing what I got to do today. I don't want to do what I have to do today. But God, I trust you past my feelings. My feelings will be placed in the Word of God. 
It's kind of like when you go to the beach. And we, we, were, we were there this past summer with my family. We went to the beach, and you, you put your stuff, like, in the sand, right? You set your stuff right there, and then you go get in the water. And, man, you're just enjoying the riding the waves in and out, just having a blast. And, man, like, two hours later, you look back, and you're like, somebody took our stuff. Like, who stole my raggedy old... But somebody stole it. They stole my shoes. They stole my towels. They stole my bag. They stole my... No, baby. Just in the little ebb and flow of the wave, it just kept moving you. And it just kept moving you. And see, we look at things and, oh, there's a huge storm. No, it's not a big storm that came. It's not a hurricane that came. It's just the ebb and flow of life. It's the one negative thought after another negative thought. It's the one negative word after the other negative word. It's the pessimistic view all the time. It's always thinking the worst, always believing the worst. I mean, y'all, there's some people you like, you don't even want to say how you're doing. You're like, hey, 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 don't ask. You never get a good report. It's just a little ebb and flow of the negativity. It's just a little ebb and flow of, I didn't read my Bible today. I didn't pray today. I didn't spend time with God today. And then I look back and like, oh my God, I'm so far away from hope. Pastor Lloyd, God is so good. He is? Why, why these bad breaks? If God is so good, like you're talking about, why this negative in my life? There's an enemy for your soul. He's working hard to keep you from your destiny. He's working double time to keep you from the very best that God has for you. But here's the good news today. The forces that are for you are greater than the forces that are against you. Keep your hope in the Lord. Job 13, 15, write these down in your notes. Job said, though he slay me, yet will I hope in him. Psalm 39, the writer says, Psalm 39 and 7, but now, Lord, what do I look for? My hope is in you. Psalm 42 and 5, why, my soul? Sometimes you got to talk to yourself. Listen, why, my soul, are you downcast? Why are you so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. Sometimes you got to take yourself outside and have a good talking to you and say, Girl, what are you hoping for? Why are you downcast? Why are you sad? Pick it up. Talk better. Think better. Psalm, Romans 8, Romans 5, Romans 5, 3 through 5. Not only so. Now listen, this is, this is the stuff we don't want to read about. It says we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character. Character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Oh, we love the story of Joseph, don't we? Oh, Carrie, we love to share your testimony. Oh, we love to talk about the goodness of God in Beth's life. We don't want to do that suffering ourselves. But you have to have suffering to produce hope. Because hope is the fruit of suffering. And many of you in this room right now, you're going through something. You've been crying it. You've been fussing about it. You've been angry. You've been negative. You have to have it. The scripture te teaches us in Romans that we should glory in our suffering. Like, glory? Really? Like, thank you, Jesus, for this suffering. Because it's going to produce perseverance in you. And a person that has perseverance is a person of good character. And a person of good character has a has a, this hope that digs deep. I can't explain it. I don't know why. Faith is head. Hope is heart. Faith is up here, believing. And hope is, I, I just feel. You've got to keep them working together. The closing song I asked 
Andre to lead us in. There's a part that says, come Holy Spirit. Come. You, can't, you can't live what we've preached about today unless we have the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, it's just a basic. It's a basic that you need in your life, but it's anything but basic. It's a supernatural power that comes from Jesus Christ. What happens is we're trying to live in these situations, y'all, and we're living without the power of the Holy Spirit. We're living without the power of prayer and the power of the Word. And so in the closing moments, I want, I want you to close your eyes. I would ask that there be no moving around unless it's an emergency. But I want you to close your eyes. I feel the Spirit dealing with us today. What is God saying to you? I don't know, Pastor Lloyd, how to really explain what God's saying to me. I don't, I don't hear him audibly. What is that first thought that's in your mind? What is that that's coming to your mind that maybe you feel a conviction about? Lloyd, have you been negative? You keep, you keep thinking the worst. You keep speaking the worst. That's what he's dealing with you about. Some of you, you got your hope, you got your anchor so rooted in self-pity. It's so rooted in bitterness. Like, just bitterness keeps coming to the surface. You're constantly offended. You're negative. You've, You've dropped your anchor in the wrong source. And I just believe today that through the power of the Holy Spirit, we can cut that rope that's attached to that negativity. I just believe through the power of the Holy Spirit, we're going to cut some negative thoughts. We're going to cut some bitterness. We're going to cut some offense. We're going to cut some unhealthy patterns and lifestyles. We're going to cut some addictions today that have been, we've been tied and they've been anchored into the wrong. And today, we're going to take up the anchor, this hope, this anchor, the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, Father, I feel your presence in this room right now. I thank you that you're meeting with us here. There's been a lot of prayer that's gone into just this Sunday. There's been people that are praying and fasting because we need a supernatural move of your spirit. And God, I pray right now as you're quickening the minds of your sons and your daughters in this room, I pray, God, that they would have the courage to sever sever some lines. Come Holy Spirit, awaken some dreams. Deliver us from the negativity, the bitterness, the addiction. I want us to sit in this moment because God's speaking to some of you. It's been, such a, it's been such a long lifestyle. It literally has become your life. The sickness has become your life. The bitterness has become your life. You're difficult to live with. There is no joy. There is no hope. But the Holy Spirit is here. The Lord's in this place. Not for a minute was I forsaken. The Lord is in this place. The Lord is in this place. Come, Holy Spirit. Do you feel that? That's the presence of the Lord. Drive us away. That's the presence of the Lord. The Lord is in this place. Don't rush past this moment too quick. The Lord is in this place. I would if you would just open your hands. Not for a minute. Just open your hands. Was I forsaken? He's reminding you. The Lord is in this place. He's not forsaken you. The Lord is in this place. 
this place. Come, Holy Spirit, into my life. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit, into my life. Oh, that's so beautiful, y'all. I see Jesus doing some things right now. Lord is in this place. Cut the road. Lord is in this place. You've been putting your faith in the wrong place. Not for a minute was I forsaken. The Lord is in this place. The Lord is in yeah, it this hurt. place. That hurt is real. Come, Holy Spirit. That betrayal is real. Dry bones away. And they did you wrong. They did Lord you wrong. The Lord is in this place. Oh, but come, Holy Spirit. The Lord is in this place. You're not going to waste it. You're not going to waste that betrayal. You're not going to waste that abuse. You're not going to waste it. He's not wasting it. He's saying, daughter, son. The Lord son, is in this place. I allowed it. The Lord is in Let it make this you. Place. Oh, it's so beautiful right Come, now. Come, Holy Spirit, dry bones awaken. The Lord is in this place. Oh, that's it, y'all. The Lord is this in was fun. this place. If you place. want to come and pray, thank you. You're welcome to this Not place. Not for a you minute want to stand. was I forsaken. The Lord is in this place. Hold on, wait on you outside. The Lord, but the Lord is, is in, in this, this place. place. The Lord is in this moment. Come, Holy Spirit. Dry bones dry awaken. Bones awaken. I see some new the dreams. Lord is in this place. I see some changed mindsets. The Lord is in this place. I see some marriages being transformed. For a I see some families being transformed. I see healing I in your body. Lord. 